All right, hello everybody and welcome to our 2021 Young Investigators 3-Minute Thesis Competition. I just wanted to note a couple housekeeping things to start us out. So as you probably just saw, um, this session is being recorded. Uh, we do ask that all participants when not presenting um, have their video off to preserve bandwidth. Um, all participants are muted upon entry and we ask that you remain muted throughout the competition. Uh, please submit any questions that you may have through the chat at any time. Um, Sarah McBride Gadgie will be monitoring the chat. Um, also, please reserve the chat function for questions relating to this event. We ask that any social interactions take place on other platforms. Um, as a reminder, uh, recording or screenshots of any kind is strictly forbidden without prior approval in writing uh, by the ORS and the author and, and or speaker. Um, for an optimal online experience, uh, please take a moment to select speaker view. Um, and with that, I will turn the mic over to Sarah to start the event. Thank you. Morning. Um, all right. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah McBride Gadgey, and I am the chair of the ISFR Education Initiatives Committee and an assistant professor at St. Louis University. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today for our first ever virtual three minute thesis competition. Before we begin, I would like to go ahead and thank today's judges. Um, that's Beth Bragdon, Chima Madukar, Megan Morin, Elizabeth Rosada Balmayor, and Hamish Simpson. They represent the wide array of biologists, engineers, and clinicians that make up our international section for fracture repair, from the trainee to the professor level. I would also like to acknowledge the ISFR officers, other members of my committee, and the ORS staff that were critical to organizing today's event. So our three-minute thesis competition is typically a part of our section scientific meeting that takes place in conjunction with the ORS annual meeting. If you're not familiar with three-minute thesis competitions, um, the term refers more to the style and focus of the competition than actually presenting a thesis or a dissertation. Each finalist will be given three minutes to present a single static slide that summarizes a body of work that they've completed or are currently working on. And this will be followed by two minutes to answer one question from either you, the audience, or from our panel of judges. And again, please submit those via the chat function to me. So unlike a typical poster or podium presentation competition that evaluates a project's scientific rigor and hypothesis, in addition to the finalist's presentation clarity and style, this rapid fire competition focuses more on the presenter's ability to convey the importance and the impact of their work in an engaging and accessible way. So the goal is to develop the skill sets needed to convey what we do as scientists in orthopedics to the public and to those in other fields. So we think this is such an important skill set for our field's future that today's winner will be taking home a $500 cash prize. So I am very excited about today's finalists and I know that you will enjoy their presentations. We have eight very talented and diverse investigators that are trainee members of the ISFR. They hail from around the globe and run the gambit from graduate students, both PhD and MD PhD, postdocs, medical students, residents, and fellows with backgrounds in biology, engineering, and in the clinic. So without further ado, let the competition begin. So our first finalist, uh, Jeffrey Nielsen uh, from Purdue University and no Novostio Incorporated. And he'll be presenting his talk on improved bone fracture repair through targeted delivery of angiogenic agents. Unless Jeff is not here. Has Jeff gotten here? I'm here. Oh, beautiful. Okay. Let me get my timer up and we will get you started. All right, Jeff, go. Bone fractures represent a huge health issue, um, as we all know. Um, patients over the age of 65 have a one in three chance of dying within a year due to their fracture. And this represents a large public health problem, which most improvements have re largely revolved around um, stabilization of the fracture and not the generation of new medicines. Um, and so there's a great need to develop new drugs to treat bone fractures. Um, the majority of drugs fail in the clinic, about 76% of them due to safety concerns. Safety issues largely revolve around um, localization of the drug in the wrong parts of the body. If we can get a drug just to where we need it, you can dramatically improve the efficacy and reduce the safety concerns. The blood is well understood to be a very important part of healing a fracture. 
um, as we go from just the hematoma phase and the inflammatory phase to the soft callus formation and fracture healing, one of the largest changes is the revascularization of the callus. If we could increase that revascularization, it is possible that you could accelerate the time it takes to heal a fracture and allow patients to get on their feet and move faster, um, thus reducing a lot of the negative side effects due to immobilization that occur with patients with fractures. The blood serves a very important role in providing cells and nutrients um, to heal a fracture. Um, what we have found, if we can utilize um, what the body does to localize proteins to the bone by using change of, of acidic oligopeptides, uh, chains of acidic amino acids, we can localize drugs very specifically to a fracture. Um, as you can see on the skeleton on the right, that's VEX-CT, relative to what a free drug would do. We found when we use this system and attached different known angiogenic agents that we were able to produce um, a very controlled localization of the drugs there, but also um, several known angiogenic agents were able to not only localized well to the fracture, but they were able to dramatically improve the healing of fractures. Um, we went through and screened a number of known angiogenic agents, uh, as you can see on the graph on the right. And one of those, QK, is a known mimetic that um, signals through VEGF. Um, we found that VEGF was able to produce a robust improvement in density and also strength of the resulting fractures. Um, we found this result not only occurred in healthy mice, but we tested this in mice with type uh, one diabetes as well, and found that we were able to dramatically improve the healing in a disease type that might be common in the elderly. Um, we think this has a potential to create new and improved therapeutics and to control where the drug is acting. Thank you. Okay, does anyone have a question? So um, I could ask a question, uh, Sarah. Brahim. Thanks very much, uh, Jess, for a uh, very kind of clear uh, presentation. I wonder what, what are the other areas that we see in patients that have a lot of problem with the vascularity are the high energy injuries. And I wondered if you thought about mimicking that at all and whether or not, uh, if there was a high energy uh, fracture, whether your model would be able to look for um, improving the vascularity with that. Yeah, there, there are an awful lot of diseases that involve vascular damage um, and the, the localization technique we use here um, with the acidic oligopeptides is, is more specific to mineralization um, and exposed hydroxyapatite. So we focused, and we've done this with more than just fractures, but we're focused primarily on diseases that involved exposure of raw hydroxyapatite. Um, you know, it, one particularly interesting might be in the case of, you know, spinal fusions, you are trying to essentially force the body to create a bone bridge and getting vasculature to grow in there. We've found that these therapeutics, these angiogenic agents work well at forcing these, these scaffolds to become vascularized and thus, you know, mineralized. And so it's been useful outside of just fractures um, that are, you know, this is an Einhorn fracture model, um, but there are absolutely implications beyond um, just fractures in terms of using angiogenic agents. The problem generally is controlling where they go. You don't want blood vessels to be forming everywhere in the body. And so this technique is revolving around using mineralization targeting, but there could be potential if we can find other targeting techniques for other diseases where increasing blood flow would be very useful. Great. Thanks very much, Jeff. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. All right, moving along. So our next finalist is Lindsay Remark from NYU Grossman School of Medicine, and she'll be presenting Dissecting the Molecular Mechanisms that Govern Notch-Mediated Skeletal Stem Cell Maintenance Throughout Adulthood and Aging. Okay, Lindsay, whenever you're ready. As I walked down the street the other day, I couldn't help but notice all the store ads aimed at slowing or reversing the aging process. Try this anti-aging skin cream to look 10 years younger. Try this supplement to restore your youthful metabolism. As far back as the 5th century BC, when Herodotus told stories of a fountain of youth, people have been fascinated by finding eternal youth as the aging process erodes at your ability to fully enjoy life. Bones are hit especially hard by the aging process. Orthopedic injuries are a leading cause of mortality and decreased quality of life in the elderly. In young healthy bones, when a fracture occurs, skeletal stem and progenitor cells, known as SSPCs, 
proliferate and then differentiate to form new osteoblasts to completely heal the bone. As you can see in the x-rays of a 25 year old patient at the top left, whose clavicle fracture successfully healed after surgery. However, our group and others have shown that with aging, the SSPC pool declines and becomes dysfunctional. Therefore, the formation of new osteoblasts to heal the fracture is insufficient for proper repair. Exemplified by the humeral fracture shown in the bottom left from an 80-year-old patient. In the Loish lab, we're interested in why SSPCs decline with age to understand how we can harness skeletal stem cells to improve bone regeneration. How can we find the fountain of youth for bone so people can live longer, more healthier, functional lives? Previous studies in our own data suggest that not signaling plays a pivotal role in maintaining SSPCs. We have a mouse model where not signaling is depleted and left in our positive SSPCs. With aging, we found increased trabecular bone formation as a result of premature SSPC differentiation as seen in the micro CT images on the top right. And while this may appear advantageous, we believe this may actually be inhibiting healing because their SSPCs have already been differentiated. We use bulk RNA sequencing to identify the transcription factor EBF3 as a novel target of the NOSH pathway that keeps SSPCs in an undifferentiated state. In a series of experiments, we confirm that EBF3 expression is NOSH dependent as shown in the graphs on the bottom right. We also have RNA sequencing data showing that middle-aged mice show less notch in EBF3 expression than young mice, which has not been previously described. This suggests that notch is necessary for SSPC maintenance, and as notch in EBF3 expression declines with age, SSPC maintenance is compromised. A balance needs to be upheld between maintenance and differentiation for proper fracture healing. We believe the notch EBF3 axis could control this balance and could be the fountain of youth we've been searching for. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, does anybody have a question for Lindsay? Give a couple seconds for people to type. Ah, here's one. Okay, so what kind of potential therapeutic could be derived from this? Yeah, thank you. I think that's a, a great question. Definitely where we, we want to go with this, um, with this project. And I think the types of therapeutics that could be derived is um, some type of um, notch, um, either inhibitor or activator, depending on the stage of fracture healing. So obviously you want notch to be active at the beginning of healing when you want your SSPCs to be uh, in greater number so that they can proliferate and that you can have enough substrate for differentiation of osteoblasts, but you don't this, want this to go too long because um, then you won't have differentiation can occur. Um, Cause I've, as I've told you, you know, notch is important in keeping these cells in an undifferentiated state. So you could imagine some type of notch activator being given, you know, before surgery um, or even EBF3 um, as maybe you could target the transcription factor instead. And we're also looking for other members of this pathway. Um, so you can even have even more targets, which greatly increases your chance of finding a therapeutic. So we're hoping for something where you could, you know, activate this early on, and then you could either use a notch inhibitor so you can get differentiation to um, ensue or an EBF3 inhibitor um, later on when you want differentiation to occur. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lindsay. All right, move on to our next finalist. So our next finalist is Tim Sung from University of Adelaide. And he'll be presenting on an unbiased gene expression analysis of the delayed fracture healing observed in Zucker diabetic fatty rats. Whenever you're ready, Tim. Whilst the COVID pandemic is affecting the world, let it not draw our attention away from the real pandemic, the diabetes pandemic. We currently have an ocean that divides us between Australia and Chicago. But do you know what we both have in common? Lots of McDonald's and KFC. And that Australia, and America are now one of the leading countries in obesity and diabetes. Patients with diabetes have complicated hospital admissions and that extends to orthopedics. Fracture healing in diabetic patients is prolonged by a staggering 87% and has a threefold higher risk of complications, including non-union and a formation of false joints. Although diabetes is so prominent, specific mRNA gene expression associated with delayed fracture healing is yet to be explored. If we can understand the factors that contribute to delayed fracture healing in patients with diabetes, then we can target our management to these factors and accelerate fracture healing. So we sought out to discover any molecular level pathological changes to the bone healing process by
by identifying gene expression of diabetic rats compared to the non-diabetic rats. So the question we were trying to answer with this research was, number one, is fracture healing delayed in diabetic rats? And number two, what mRNA gene expressions are upregulated in diabetic rats? So we analyzed 12 mice and split them into cohorts of diabetic and non-diabetic rats. The femur was artificially fractured and the callus formed four weeks post-surgery was harvested and analyzed for X-ray and differential gene expression. Radiographs clearly showed delaying fracture healing in the diabetic group. Additionally, we found significant upregulation in inflammatory gene expressions, notably the IL-6 and the CCL group. Therefore, we postulate that diabetic mice had a, much, uh, had a more biochemically inflamed state around the fracture site, which is clinically significant. We think this is much higher than physiologically expected and is implicated in delayed fracture healing. So what now? The next aspect of this research will be to advance the human trials. We believe that similar techniques that we use on rats can be safely applied to humans and verify if the same mRNA gene expression is found in fracture sites. And if so, the question is, is this clinically significant for us to pay attention to? Can we target these specific gene expressions to reduce time in fracture healing? This may be the pathway we take to address the issues that affect our generation, delayed fracture healing in diabetic patients. We need to start thinking about this today before the real pandemic is out of our control. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, okay, so if anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or judges, feel free to unmute yourselves. See Hamish. Uh, I'll just wait for a moment to see if you've got a question coming in on the chat first there. Uh, so but if I've got a question for Tim, if, if there isn't anything coming on the chat. I don't see one yet. You can go ahead. Oh, hang on. I think there's one just come in now then. So, so let, let's. I can see it. Um, so Evan asks, um, or says, a lot of these transcripts are also seen in senescent cells. Did you look at senescent markers like P16 or P21? Thanks for the question. So with this gene, uh, with this study, we've analyzed over 1,000 genes, but then we've narrowed our 1,000 genes into 18 significant genes, which was um, filtered out by using a false discovery rate of less than 20%. Um, so out of those, I didn't look, we didn't look specifically for P16, P21 markers, um, which I, from my understanding, wasn't a part of the 18 genes that was upregulated. Some other genes that, was, that we specifically looked into was IL-6, CXCL1, and then 123, CCL720, and the other things like sclerostin. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. So our next finalist is Augustine Sayas from UC Davis Health, and he will be presenting on muscle secretome augments bone healing and regeneration. Augustine, whenever you are ready. Orthopedic trauma surgeons love radiographs. We assess the patient and then we spend countless hours pouring over these films, analyzing the fracture characteristics, determining the optimal mode of fixation and devising the ideal construct. The typical equation can be simplified as bone plus blood supply plus metal equals fracture healing. However, this is not always the case. Open fractures and those with associated muscle loss do not heal as often as one third of the time. The problem is the radiographs in the equation do not account for the muscle that encases the bone. Surgeons have developed ingenious approaches to preserve the muscle, recognizing its importance in blood supply and functional outcomes, but little further research has been done. Could muscle play a more significant role? The focus of my research has been the role of muscle and fracture healing, and the early results have been exciting. In a rat model with a bony femoral defect of critical size, meaning it won't heal on its own, you can get this to heal with local delivery of BMP2, a potent bone regenerative molecule. That same model though, with a local muscle defect, will not heal even with super physiologic dosing of BMP2. Our lab has looked at the growth factors and cytokines that muscle secretes. We term this the muscle secretome. The muscle secretome consists of numerous factors, including IGF-1, VEGF, interleukin-8, platelet-derived growth factor, and bone morphogenic proteins. All that have been shown to be key factors in bone regeneration. 
illustrating muscle's role as a paracrine organ for bone. Furthermore, local delivery of that muscle secretome to the same rat model will result in bone regeneration. This demonstrates muscle's direct effects on fracture healing. Even further, if you take mesenchymal stem cells and you expose it to this muscle secretome, you get a synergistic effect with those stem cells now secreting factors that further augment that bone healing uh, avenue of potential therapeutic research. So although we can't see muscle on radiographs, we now recognize its importance in fractured care. The simplified equation is actually much more complex, but it needs to include muscle as an essential element for fracture healing. As we clinicians and scientists look to further enhance fracture healing, the therapeutic potential of the muscle bone interface demands further investigation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. All right, does anybody have a question? There is something in this chat, Sarah, I think. Ah, yes, see one now. All right, so how to ensure the quality of the muscle secretome? I think that's a great question. I think, you know, just looking at in vitro, the myoblast producing all these factors doesn't take into account the different muscle types and doesn't take into account the different muscle locations. And especially if you're thinking about damaged muscle or muscle that you're transplanting in terms of a free flap, those all could be very different sort of secretomes being expressed at different times in different locations. So I think going forward, what we really need to do is look at some of these in vivo models and try to either using RNA or DNA sequencing, look at what are the secretomes being produced at different locations at different times in different sort of models. Thank you so much. Moving right along, this is such a fast paced competition. So our next finalist is Neomasa Pukase from the Stedman Philippin Research Institute. And you'll be discussing smart bone plates to monitor fracture healing in a rabbit model. Whenever you're ready. Think back to the world 100 years ago. What do you see? A thriving American economy, a time of hope and prosperity, and the widespread use of electrical appliances, radios, washing machines, and x-rays. This usage changed everything, especially within the medical field. The use of x-rays became standard in diagnosing bone fractures all over the country. It was finally possible to see what was actually happening within the human body. Although convenient, x-rays pose a serious drawback, radiation. Because of potential harm to the human body, significant care must always be taken to minimize the side effects throughout clinical practice. Hundred years have passed since the discovery of this technology. How do we view X-rays today? X-rays are still commonly used in clinics all around the world. What about another form of technology, CT scans? Currently, we know that CT scans are more effective at detecting the morphology of complex fractures. However, CT scans produce an even greater dose of radiation than X-rays, resulting in less frequent use. Every day, we use our internet to gather information, computers to listen to music, and smartphones to make phone calls. Humans continue to create extraordinary inventions today with the goal of creating healthier and more purposeful lives. Despite the amazing advances in technology, we still use x-rays to make the same diagnosis we did 100 years ago. The world is growing. Medicine is evolving. Something needs to change. In the future, where doctors and patients have to wait for the next x-ray to make clinical decisions? No way. How do we change this? It starts with smart bone plate. By incorporating a sensor into a fixation material, commonly used in orthopedic surgery, smart bone plate actually monitor the hearing process of fractures over time, allowing doctors to instantly determine the extent of hearing process. No more x-rays, no more radiation, only bone plates. This is the future of medicine. This is changing lives. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. All right. Any questions? I can have a short question, Sarah. Um, 
great presentation. I like very, I enjoy very much your idea. Um, wouldn't the sensors, I, I see in the bottom of your slide in the, the sensors go through the fracture. Wouldn't yes. the sensors interfere with the healing process? So uh, yeah, uh, thank you for your question. That's a very important point. And we actually, uh, we recently uh, published paper uh, regarding this uh, uh, smart bone plate using the uh, similar sensor. And that's a, a MICE project. And we uh, confirmed uh, uh, by uh, historical analysis that uh, the, uh, the sensor is very thin the sensor uh, didn't interfere with uh, bone regeneration. We already uh, uh, confirmed about that. Thank you for your question. So, so in this uh, study, we extend to rabbit mother. Yeah, thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. All right, our next finalist is Miriam Shafon from Ulm University. And she will be presenting on chronic psychosocial stress disturbs bone fracture healing. Thank you. I think many of you have experienced chronic psychosocial stress once in your life because it is an increasing burden in our modern society. Chronic stress is really unhealthy, so it is a great risk factor for the development of mental disorders like depression or post-traumatic stress disorder, short PTSD, and also um, inflammatory disorders, like for example, inflammatory bowel disease. And it also has effects on bones since these mental stress induced mental disorders are associated with osteoporosis and increased fracture risk. We therefore aim to investigate the effects of chronic psychosocial stress on fracture healing using the, C uh, the chronic subordinate colony housing or short CSC paradigm, which is a preclinically uh, pre validated mouse model for stress-induced PTSD. Here, four small male mice are co-housed together with a larger dominant male mouse for 19 days. And as a control, four single-housed mice are used. When the mice um, received a femur osteotomy after CSC or SHC exposure, stressed mice showed a misbalanced inflammatory response after fracture and a disturbed fracture healing, as indicated by a decreased flexural rigidity of the fractured femur, as well as a decreased bone volume per tissue volume and tissue mineral density of the fracture colors three weeks after fracture. Interestingly, Stressed mice showed an increased expression of tyrosine hydroxylase, which is the rate-limiting enzyme of the catecholamine synthesis pathway in the early fracture callus, indicating an increased local release of catecholamines. And since we thought that this locally increased catecholamine signaling is responsible for the psychosocial stress effects on fracture healing, we injected both stressed and unstressed mice with the beta adrenal receptor antagonist propranolol, which is already used in the clinics, to block the catecholamine signaling. And indeed, propranolol could block the stress effects on fracture healing. So with this, we could show that chronic psychosocial stress leads to a disturbed fracture healing and that these effects can be blocked just by using a beta blocker, giving a uh, possible treatment strategy for chronically stressed or PTSD patients with disturbed fracture healing. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'll give a second for a question to come in. Sarah, if there's no other question, I have one for her. Go for it. Hi, Miriam. Great talk. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you've tried any other kinds of stressors. So you housed in this experiment, small mice with a large dominant uh, male mouse. Have you tried any other types of stress like restraint stress or wrong time feeding stress or something along those lines? And would you expect maybe to see the same um, outcomes? That's a really good question. Thank you. Um, so there are different stress models, um, like, for example, restraint stress or, um, yeah, like predatory stress, something like this. And um, most of them are acute stress models. And here um, we would expect a little bit different outcomes because um, I think mainly, mainly um, glucocorticoid signaling plays a big role then because it's um, highly upregulated when you have acute stress. 
And um, yes, so our mouse model is um, a quite reliable chronic stress model, which um, mimics the um, psychosocial, um, yeah, the PTSD disease quite well. So they have, um, these mice have a really similar phenotype like PTSD patients. Right. Thank you so much, Miriam. Let's see, next up. Uh, so next we have Feeney Q from Washington University in St. Louis, and she will be presenting on the cellular and molecular mechanisms of murine digit regeneration. Whenever you're ready. Injuries or diseases that lead to limb loss pose important challenges to the medical community. Almost 200,000 Americans undergo amputations annually, and so do many of our pets. This speaks to the fact that the regeneration of musculoskeletal tissues is limited, such that healing often culminates in scarring. However, there is evidence for digit tip regrowth following injury in humans, suggesting that we may possess an innate regenerative ability. To harness this ability, the mechanisms driving the regeneration of complex tissues must be better understood. Towards this end, I use the mouse digit as a model to study limb regeneration. After digit tip amputation in adult mice, various progenitor cell populations, collectively called the blastema, restore the bone and soft tissues. Interestingly, amputations that occur further up the limb result in scarring. The mechanisms underlying this differential response are unknown and could provide new insights into the development of regenerative therapies. Since bone formation is crucial for digit regeneration, I hypothesize that limb outgrowth is driven primarily by osteoblast lineage cells. To test this, I surveyed the identities and gene profiles of all the blastema cells. While multiple mesenchymal cell types contributed to regeneration, I noticed that osteoprogenitors and osteoblasts express genes known to drive embryonic limb development and morphogenesis, suggesting that in addition to making new bone, they might also help reestablish the proper limb pattern. Some of you may be wondering now, where do these osteoprogenitors come from and how might they contribute to digit regeneration over time? To answer this, I tracked the location and behavior of osteoblast lineage cells. Before amputation, I labeled the cells in the periosteum and osteum and the bone red. After amputation, the red periosteal and endosteal cells proliferated and differentiated into osteoblasts to form the new digit bone. A few even became fibroblasts, indicating some level of cellular plasticity. Next, I want to see if activated osteoprogenitors are necessary for digit regeneration. So I conditionally ablated proliferating osteoblasts. As expected, the bone failed to regenerate in the absence of these cells. However, there was still some soft tissue outgrowth, suggesting that partial recovery was possible without scar formation. In summary, I hope I've convinced you that osteoblast lineage cells are critical for digit regeneration. Strategies to activate these cells, as well as ways to prevent scarring, will be crucial elements of a biologic therapy for amputees. Ultimately, I hope this work will lead to novel approaches that promote the regeneration of complex tissues. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Benny. All right, give a minute for a question to come in. So if, if nobody else has got a question, um, Finny, could I just ask, very, very interesting kind of talk. I wonder if you could just say a bit more about, you mentioned briefly about the patterning. Could you just say a bit more about uh, what you've learned about the patterning of uh, limb in the limb regrowth and how the cells you've looked at may uh, kind of determine the patterning? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Uh, so I've noticed that the endosteal cells and the periosteal cells actually behave very differently, where the endosteal cells will kind of uh, reestablish the core um, shape of the original bone, whereas the periosteum will actually just add mostly to the dorsal portion of the bone. Um, and so if you do different levels of regeneration or of amputation, where you remove more of the periosteal cells versus the endosteal cells, you'll actually get um, different shapes uh, resulting from the regeneration. And I'm really interested in kind of understanding the differences and how the gene expression profiles might be different between these two types of cells. Could you look at it all between the signaling between the periosteal and the endosteal cells and how, um, how much they're signaling between them? Yeah, that's a really great point. So it seems like both of them are pretty similar. So I've done 
um, some EDU tracking and they all proliferate at roughly the same rate um, and contribute to the blastema at the same rate. I think in, in general, uh, their response to amputation is very similar, but it seems like they, they might have some spatial memory encoded and that's up to me to figure out in future experiments. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. And last but certainly not least, uh, we have Peter Schwarzenberg from Lehigh University, and he'll be presenting on virtual mechanical testing of tibial fracture healing. Whenever you're ready, Peter. Great. Thank you. So fractures of the tibia are relatively common and take about four to five months to heal. However, in about 12% of patients, healing can become delayed or stalled, resulting in what's called a non-union. These non-unions are a serious health concern that can lead to increased pain, disability, opioid dependency, and depression, resulting in much greater health care costs across the board. While there are some semi-quantitative and qualitative tools for measuring fracture healing, there are no strictly quantitative tools for measuring the healing progress in vivo in the clinic. Because of this, we have developed a virtual mechanical test for tibia fractures to measure the structural integrity of the healing progress. So to start, we developed and validated this technique on a large animal cohort, specifically sheep. We use a sheep model because we have physical mechanical data to compare to our virtual test. The study consisted of 33 ovine osteotomies that were all stabilized by medial plating and had a CT scan at the time of sacrifice. 3D models were built from the CT scan and then meshed for use with finite element analysis. Element-specific material properties were assigned to capture the complex gradient of the tissue that had formed during the healing, um, and we used an optimized scaling law specifically for ovine cortical bone. And then finally, these image-based finite element models were virtually torsion tested, mimicking the physical test to measure fracture healing. We found that there were strong correlations and high absolute agreements between the virtual and physical mechanical test, much better than any of the traditional measures taken. This demonstrated that virtual mechanical testing is a reliable surrogate for physical mechanical testing. But how does this translate to the clinic? So we conducted a small clinical study at Cork University Hospital that consisted of 27 tibial fracture patients. They were all treated with ream diam nailing and had a CT scan at 12 weeks. These CT scans are ultra low dose and equivalent to a single X-ray. We separated the patients into a normal healing group and a group with known comorbidities. These comorbidities consisted of things like smoking, alcohol or substance abuse, and diabetes, anything known to slow bone fracture healing. We built finite element models in the same way as in the sheep and performed a virtual torsion test to measure torsional rigidity of the construct. What we found was while there was no difference in time to clinical union, there was a large and significant difference in the torsional rigidity with the comorbidity groups having a 23% lower mean rigidity. This showed that these virtual mechanical tests can detect structural deficiency in bone in bone healing in patients with comorbidities. And furthermore, this technique shows promise for the design and evaluation of preclinical and clinical studies, as well as a promise as a powerful tool for clinical diagnostic to help patients with their fracture healing and get back to full health quicker. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. All right, we already have a question. So good job with typing quickly. Um, it is from Jeff Nielsen. He asks, can you comment on the relevance of torsional testing versus four-point bend testing in being a good measure of the strength of a bone? Yeah, absolutely. Um, while it is important to know the different modes of testing in uh, preclinical animal models, especially large animal models where numbers are so limited, torsion testing is just so much more robust. It's um, very independent of um, rotation of orientation and very robust to set up deviations compared to four-point bending. So that's why we stuck with four point or with rotate with torsion testing over four point bending um, because preclinically that's what's just traditionally done in these large animal studies. Well, thank you so much. Well, what a wonderful set of presentations. And I think all of our finalists deserve a big round of virtual applause. So feel, feel free to use those little emoticons. Um, the judges and I are going to quickly step into a breakout room to determine the winner. And while they deliberate, we do have a short presentation about the section. And when we return, we will announce this year's three-minute thesis winner. So we hope you stick around for the announcement. Going, going through, through the board, board and uh, back, back and announce our winner. Um, um, so, so I'm Katie Nixon. Nixon. Um, I, I, I am on the educational, educational programming committee. Um, well, well, again, again, and thank you so much for attending today. today. Um, I'm, I'm just going to do a quick uh, kind of membership overview. Um, so for ISR, our mission is really to advance the science of biology, regulation, fracture human barrier, and trauma to really lead to the education area. So 
history about us, I have our work first founded in 1987. Um, the first meeting was organized by Hans Yusof um, and was held in Stockholm. Uh, we basically, they basically partnered with ORS to establish ISFR as an ORS section in uh, 2017. And so we currently have about 150 members. And if you are not a member today, we would love to have you um, join. And so our mission overall is to advance uh, the science of bone biology, bone regeneration, fracture repair, and trauma to again lead to that improved patient care. Um, and so there are a lot of really wonderful benefits that do come with um, becoming a member. And so um, you would have access to the section meeting, e-news and communication um, that we send out. Uh, you would also have um, research collaboration opportunities, um, which is a really um, wonderful opportunity. Um, you would have education, research and industry networking available to you. Um, as well as the eligibility for grants and section awards, um, which is also, again, often provided through our e-news and communication. There's also a lot of really great uh, volunteer opportunities within the section. Um, and so we kind of have four overall goals. Our first goal is to really uh, provide a worldwide forum, uh, resources and tools to our research community. Um, our second goal is to have a strong international and diverse membership within the ORS ISFAR research community, which um, we have a really wonderful network for this, um, and I know we really value that moving forward. We also um, aim to increase international awareness of ORS, ISFR, and really the importance of our research in our field, which is why events like this are really wonderful, especially with our young investigators, um, to really move this field forward. Uh, our fourth goal is to build a solid internal um, foundation to support the ORS, ISFR mission. And so, um, we're really looking to build a strong internal foundation to support this ISFR mission um, that I talked about. So we um, will develop relevant scientific content for ISFR members. Um, so we have our ORS ISFR section meeting, um, as well as you all know, the ORS annual meeting, um, ORS workshops and the biennial meeting as well. We also have year long webinars available and ISFR breakthroughs and newsletters and Twitter. Um, so again, follow us on Twitter. We have a lot of really great um, research highlights um, and as well as membership there. We also aim to increase ISFR impact by taking programming uh, to strategic partners. So the 2020 ISFR task force identified kind of the following strategic partners for 2021. Um, so Termis is the Tissue Engineering and Regenerative Medicine International Society, and then OTA, the Orthopedic Trauma Association. And so we're also um, looking to build diverse membership to strengthen ISFR as kind of the hub for fracture research, which again was really wonderful for today, um, and also increase member investment. And so finally, um, we looking to kind of have these investments, we have these awards to highlight achievements. So um, during the ORS 2021, we had nine um, section scientific awards. We had three for podium, one for poster, and five abstract awards, um, as well as the three-minute thesis today, um, which a couple of our um, presenters today actually uh, were winners of these scientific awards um, at the ORS 2021. Um, our ORS annual section meeting, we have invited speakers, networking, and career development. Um, we also have our biennial satellite meeting, um, 2020 in Europe, hopefully. Um, we'll be presenting work. There'll be opportunities to network with peers. Um, we will have travel awards available for that, as well as scientific and presentation awards. We also have a new diversity award to support attendance for this biennial satellite meeting um, for ISFR. And then the development of ISFR Connect ORS exchange um, grants will be coming soon, focusing on both academic and industry. And so we would love um, if anyone here is not a member of ISFR, um, you can find more information at this website. Um, as well as, again, we have these um, breakthrough newsletters that come out. You can follow us on Twitter. We have a really great couple hashtags to, to see some current research um, with our, our, that our membership has available. And for any questions, please feel free to contact us. Um, and then again, thanks so much for um, joining us today. Uh, and I'm really excited to kind of see where or who our winner is when the judges come back. And I think in the meantime, um, Bailey has a couple um, little uh, quizzes for everyone here. So stay tuned. And Bailey, I'm sorry to put, put you on the spot. But, oh, perfect. So hopefully those came up for everyone. So if you could please just take a second um, to answer the question that hopefully just popped up on your poll. 
in the meantime. Thanks so much. I'm sorry, I just got everyone's comments that my audio was out. So I apologize for what you did not hear. I can also pull back up the slides um, if there's something specific. I don't know when my audio cut out, but I do apologize for that. And maybe um, we can make that available um, to everyone that was in attendance today as well. I, I'm sorry again about that. I just saw all the messages. Would it be okay if I said something about um, the ISFR newsletter, Bailey? Would that be okay? Yeah, Hannah, I think that would be great. Okay, awesome. Hey, everyone. Um, my name is Hannah Daly. Um, I am the communications committee chair for the ISFR. And um, I put together the newsletter that you guys received, the breakthroughs newsletter. And I hope you guys have a chance to look at that when it comes across your desk. But I wanted to uh, call attention to the feature in there. Uh, there's a clickable link if you would like to submit good news that's coming out of um, your groups like papers published, awards that you or your students are getting. We love to share those kinds of things with the section membership. Also, if you have suggestions for someone, a section member who should be spotlighted in the newsletter, or if you'd like to volunteer to write a hot topic for us for the newsletter, we love all of these things and would love to hear from you. So there's a form on our ISPAR page, or you can get the link from the last newsletter that went out. And we really look forward to hearing from you and sharing about the great things that you all are doing in the form of the newsletter and on our social media. And of course you can reach out to me also. Um, and then uh, we'll make sure to disseminate that good news as widely as possible. Thanks. Okay, so um, while we're waiting for um, our judges to come back, we did have a really, what I think is very interesting um, results from our poll. So I'm just gonna share those with you guys just so we have a, a good idea of who um, who is kind of here today and joining us. Um, so about 86% of you are already a member um, of ORS, 14% um, are not. Um, for what kind of best describes our distribution here today, 38% um, are engineers, 29% um, are biologists, 19% um, are actually orthopedic surgeons, and then 14% are others. So we have a really good group of people here today from a wide range of disciplines. Um, and then kind of moving forward, how we heard about this event. So about 20, well, 24% of you heard from social media and then 24% also from our um, ORS Connect e-newsletter. Um, ISFR newsletter specifically, about 10% heard and then 43% from a colleague or friend. So thanks so much again for joining us today. Um, and I'm really excited to have such a, a again, a wide range of um, disciplines involved in this. And I actually, sorry to put you on the spot, but Evan, maybe I know you threw in the um, Twitter handle. Would you want to do a quick pitch to, I think Twitter is such a great way to really um, stay active, you know, with our current membership community and research. Would you maybe want to speak if you're available for a second on that as well? Yeah, I'm available. Um, Perfect. <laughs> yeah. So I'm the chair of the social media committee for all of ORS, but we're lucky as a section that we're one of the I think we're the only section with a Twitter handle for the section. And so as Hannah said, if you want things to be highlighted um, in terms of events, uh, grants being awarded, publications, anything related to ORS, ISFR membership or news, um, follow us on Twitter um, and also feel free to tweet at me or DM me. And also there is a link. Um, I was trying to find it and I can put it in the chat to where you can submit this news to the ISFR staff as well to be highlighted on social media. Thank you. Thank you, Bailey. Yeah, it looks like, so Bailey put that in the link or in the chat. And so feel free to submit any of your uh, good news to us and we'll be sure to highlight on social media as well as in the ISFR breakthrough newsletter that Hannah just discussed. And with that, I guess we're kind of wrapping up here on, on the judges end. Does anyone have any general questions about ORS or ISFR membership? Um, we have, um, you know, Bailey here as well to provide some, some answers. And so this is a great time if you have any, any burning questions um, that we can answer for you as well. I have a question, Katie. Um, I heard recently that we are having an in-person ORS meeting next year. So I was wondering if there's also going to be a section meeting um, that's in person. Yes, the section scientific meetings will take place in person during the ORS 2022 annual meeting in Tampa. Thanks, Bailey. You're welcome. I was gonna say, do we have an idea 
of the location in Europe for the section meeting. Um, that's replacing the Toronto meeting. That is currently being discussed um, and new program and ideas are being developed. So look for more information to be announced soon for 2022, the biennial meeting. And uh, Bailey just threw that in the chat as well. I just got a note um, from Sarah that they're finishing up on their end. But if you look in the chat, there's a good link for the ORS 2020, 2022, oh my goodness, annual meeting. And um, a note that our abstract submissions are open in June. So we would love yeah, to have you join us with that as well. It must be a close competition. There's some great presentations today. And it looks like our judges have come back now. Right. Um, I think it's over to me now. Is it, uh, uh, Katie, is that okay now for me to... Um, the judges have returned, as you can see. Um, it was an extremely difficult decision, which is why we've been uh, uh, away kind of for, for so long. Um, but I would like to thank all of the finalists. You, you all did a kind of great job, uh, all kept time and actually were engaging. And it was just kind of, kind of brilliant. Um, I'd like to thank the judges uh, who uh, have actually given up their, their time to kind of go, go through all of these. Uh, also to thank the RS team who um, uh, did a fantastic job in actually just kind of keeping things on, kind of on track there. And, um, but then without kind of further thing, just to, to announce the winner as uh, uh, somebody who engaged us with talking about McDonald's and the pandemic. And we thought actually for this particular uh, competition, which was in terms of just trying to kind of engage an audience, uh, we decided that uh, uh, Tim, uh, Tim Sun was actually the kind of the, the winner. So Tim, thanks very much for, for your talk and uh, uh, you've won today, but all the um, presentations were great. All had kind of good aspects that we wanted to, uh, to acknowledge. Finally, um, I would just like to say the, a big thanks to Sarah McBride Gadgey, who without her, this, this uh, event wouldn't have happened. She's really pulled the whole thing together, had done an absolutely superb job, a vast amount of work uh, to uh, behind the kind of scenes doing it. So uh, really big thank you to her. And I think all of the uh, finalists should uh, kind of send her thanks as well. So thanks very much indeed, Sarah. Without you, it wouldn't have been possible. So really brilliant job. Thank you. And that's it. Thank you all for coming.